Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, Episode 79, The Welsh Crusades. The Welsh relationship with crusading is complicated and a difficult one to discuss, mostly because, as you can imagine, our source material is sparse, but also because the Welsh seem to have had only small interest in talking about it themselves. So for this discussion, I have leaned heavily on Professor Catherine Herlock's work. I think she's done some great research in piecing together this subject. Now, of course, the Crusades are an event mired in modern politics as much as they were in the past, and our history and the history of the Middle East feature heavily in this discussion. By the same token, don't consider this podcast to be casting judgment on the Crusades or having an opinion on what the Crusades were and how effective they may have been and whether they caused damage in the Middle East. That is not the role of this podcast. And that's for historians who have a much better grasp on the history of it than I do. But what we're talking simply about here is the perspective of the Welsh in the Crusading era and as well how much their participation in the uh, Crusades were influenced by propaganda, by inspiring stories, and specifically by the history of previous crusades and previous uh, Christian martyrs. So, for most of Christendom, the target of their ire was the arrival and success of the Muslim kingdoms, their capture of the former Roman lands, some of which included the Holy Land, and that was the focus of their zeal. In the Welsh Chronicles, and in other descriptions of the Welsh in that period, there was at least another seemingly equally despised target. And again, this wasn't just the Welsh. There were other kingdoms where this was the case, but the Jewish population seemed to be, in their view, equally uh, resented and disliked and considered on equal measure as evil as the Muslim population to some of them. Numbers of Jews had arrived at the invitation of William the Conqueror in 1070 to England. They came from Normandy and were not allowed to be landholders. They were instead settling into traditional roles forced upon them by Christian morals, including being financiers, in part because Christian ideas about uh, bank interest was that Christians should never be moneylenders. So they considered that a sin. Of course, then that means they had to borrow money. So people who wanted to be able to borrow money from had to be able to allow for interest to be accrued. Thus, that became one of the roles that Jews played in European society at the time, which was a very strange role for them to have to carry forward because, of course, it led to a lot of other issues for them. And so there's definitely some of this problem. Uh, the arrival of Jews made an impression, certainly in Wales, enough so that in the life of St. David, the author, uh, and excuse my pronunciation because it's not going to be great, Rich Varch, uh, paid special attention to the Jews. This, in part, may be down to the author's lament of the arrival of the marcher lords to South Wales in the years prior to writing, and of course, they would be associated with them. Uh, the ideas in Wales as the First Crusade dawned, according to Professor Herlock, were in tune with the larger world, as we said earlier, where in preparing for the crusade, many Jewish people were attacked in France, and also later this would be the case in Germany and in England. The precarious nature of Jewish tolerance in Western Europe, because they were moneylenders and bankers of the day, meant that they were easy targets when medieval kings wanted to gather their financing, or they were looking for people to blame for various issues. So that they became the simple and easiest way of getting money or in, you know, wiping out a debt, wipe out the person you owe the debt to. It set a pattern which, of course, would go down to our modern day experience. So this is not an uncommon problem for the Jewish people in Europe. During the Middle Ages across Europe, there was a push by some people, uh, authors specifically, uh, to memorialize crusading. In fact, the uh, Song of Roland, for example, features a knight of Charlemagne's court who would fight in Spain for the Christian ideals against the Moors. His story was a popular one in France because of the links to the old kingdom of the 8th and 9th century, kind of as a link to a different age, a more 
vigorous age, an age of people considered to be better than us now. Very similar to the old ideas of like, you know, the 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 golden generation, you know, looking at the people and the ideals in a way that kind of puts on rose-colored glasses. You look at the old kingdom that used to unite most of Europe and you think, gee, why aren't we still like that? How come we can't get back to that? What were the things that drove them? And so there's linkages made, of course, to the idea of, of their Christian beliefs and of how much more stable and organized they were. And Roland's story is kind of covered in that and then linked to a crusading type experience. And this became popular across Europe. In fact, it was suggested that the reason that it was found in the Red Book of Hergerst uh, was because the Cistercian monks saw it as a good propaganda fodder. It was something they could use to encourage crusading. So it even made it into Wales in documents which contained Welsh stories. And in fact, the whole uh, Charlemagne cycle made it there. So it's an interesting thing to realize that these romanticized books were being featured across Europe, not just in France, not just in the local vicinity of the story, but actually in Germany, in England, in the Isle of Man, in Wales, all of these places were picking up this story and carrying it forward. Similarly, I guess, in a way of how Arthur gets picked up in France and becomes a huge story for the French, even though it's obviously not a French story originally. So there is a lot of linkages to that. Um, the interesting side to this from the, the monks' prospect of things was that they saw it as important because in the story there are versions of the death of Roland. In the French version it talks more about upholding the honor of France, of remembering the old times, remembering the old kingdom, as well as being a good Christian. And he enters, you know, the kingdom of heaven as a good Christian. In the case of the Welsh version of this, it is modified to tell a story of someone who you know, remembers his comrades who came with him, the fact that they're so far away from home, even though he's only in Spain in in the story, uh, and the fact that they have traveled such a great distance to fight together and to be unified under, you know, the holy rule. And thus they rejoin heaven as blessed martyrs, even though they were warriors. So all of this kind of links back to that ideal and so the story is very much about making a crusade look like something more than just being a story or an ideal, but rather that it is something that is holy and distinct. And of course, the Pope was saying this, and I'm sure they were getting this at church. But this is a story that, you know, you read to your kids at night, you maybe take home and it's kind of the exciting story you know you talk about just very similar in a way to the the george and the dragon and all of those kind of things all of these romance stories that kind of brought this idea of of chivalric honor and duty and the ideals of the crusade and all of these while not exactly coexisting are coming together in this particular instance. Uh, we know for a fact that in this high medieval period, there was a great push towards trying to make knights something more honorable, something more noble than what they are generally, which is just a bunch of thugs that go around and carry out the orders of whoever can pay them the most. And so this is one of those driving forces that uses that ideal. Now, if we look specifically in Wales, we can see that there is a push coming, and it obviously starts with the Normans because it comes into the marcher areas first. But it will spread to North Wales, and by the 13th century, it there is a drive and a push from the monks, from the religious folks, but eventually just from the general feeling and some of the poets and bards of the time also contributed to this discussion of the Crusades. Uh, it is felt uh, bards such as Iladir, uh, Ionan Wan, and, uh, oh boy, going to mess this up, but we'll try our best, uh, Llinhwark uh, Ap Llewellyn were familiar with the Crusades and used language similar to the Romance language of the Charlemagne cycle. Uh, in effect, to use their motifs and to use their writing style, which 
obviously means they were influenced with them, obviously meant that they knew about them. So all of this was influencing the area at a time period where, and these bards and writers knew something of the Third Crusade, seemed to talk about it in some way, uh, even in writings to their king. So there's this general sense that there is an understanding of what's going on and there's there's an acceptance of it. Uh, the spread of the Charlemagne cycle in Wales appears to be something arriving likely from the Isle of Man in the 13th century, for example. Uh, there are arguments by several scholars as to what then happened uh, by how this spread the popular idea of crusades. The fact that it did so is probably best uh, drawn out by the fact that there are a number of copies in Welsh. The more likely survival copies we have means the more likely it was spread around. It, because just simply a lot of the original copies would have been destroyed over the years. You just assume that if you find more than one or two or three, uh, you're probably talking that they were fairly popular documents. Unless they were things like broadsheets, which of course we know in later times when we have a printing press, broadsheets of course are made with paper, which is generally more going to fall apart quicker than vellum so there's not necessarily as much evidence but in this period when they're still using traditional methods of vellum to print documents and go to the bother of writing them the more copies you have like i said the more likely it is that they're they was relatively popular uh in the historical sources there are evidence for the welsh crusaders they feature in the case of morgan ap cadwin uh the son of the famous king of powys uh, was said to have gone on crusade in 1128 after killing his brother three years previous. This date is important as it coincides with the arrival of Hugh de Pans, uh, master and co-founder of the Knights Templar, who was sent to Western Europe to raise troops to protect the crusader states at the time. After the first crusade, of course, there were various states set up in, in the Holy Land, uh, one of which is the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which is where he's come from. Uh, Morgan dies in 1129, actually in Cyprus, never really reaches the Holy Land, never really carries out much. Um, however, the, this idea of a prince feeling the need to cleanse himself due to the sins of killing his kin, to be honest, feels like a foreign idea in Welsh history at the time. Due to the inheritance notions in Wales, it almost seems like wiping out close relatives is a requirement to achieving the throne. So while we don't know fully what drove him to do it, we do know that it was not the only example. Uh, another one that's fairly famous is in 1144, pilgrims from Dovid and Caradigion drown on their way to Jerusalem. Herlock suggests that at that point in history, the term crusader was not something that was in use, especially in Welsh. There was, in fact, no word for it even in Welsh, but there is a word called pilgrim. So the idea that they were pilgrims would mesh better as men going on crusade rather than going to a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So this shows that there were likely men in Wales joining the Crusaders, but our chronicles, annals, and the like were not really focusing on talking about them from a Welsh perspective. They were not critical compared to the local conflicts and the local problems. Uh, in fact, in 1187, Hercules, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, arrives, signing up large numbers of knights and foot soldiers. Again, the chroniclers are at pains to point out that the crusade had problems with the Saracens and Jews, even though we know that wasn't the case. And Gerald of Wales, our Norman source for the conquest in the 12th century, tells us that 3,000 men signed up for the crusades at this point. Most of these men are coming from the marcher areas, though, so we're talking about conquered lands, not talking about North Wales. Uh, that's about to change. In 1188, the Archbishop Baldwin comes into Britain, and working with uh, Gerald of Wales, amongst others, they sought people to join the Crusades. In fact, Gerald says it this way, We worked very hard to make a success of our mission. About 3,000 men were signed up with the cross, all of them highly skilled in the use of spear and the arrow, most experienced in military affairs and only too keen to attack enemies of our faith at the first opportunity. They were all sincerely and warmly committed to Christ's service. So in other words, they were signed up to be crusaders. Uh, and that is an important part of this because... They are coming from the Norman areas of Wales, but nonetheless, they did sign up quite a load of men. 
Now, we can't know, of course, whether 3,000 men is legitimately what they got, but because, of course, writers have tendencies to drive numbers up, even up to this day when we talk about things like attendance figures, you know, they, they love to go with the biggest number. So it's not surprising that this number might be called into question. But there's no doubt that there must have been some success for this mission because the fact is, is, is it's being called by Henry II to drive his crusader army. And they're going into both the Welsh marches or the Norman held Wales and even into the Welsh areas that were held by native rulers. And they were trying to get Welsh men at arms to sign up and of course henry had to this point been using welsh mercenaries so there was a well timed and, and built pattern of this so it's interesting to see that this was one of the reasons and, and methods that they used to try and drive up uh people to join up was trying to convince them of the rightness of the mission of course one of the contentions for why people joined this was actually in part to avoid having to pay taxes because one of the things that the uh, the church did was it required a what's called a Saladin tax, which was effectively money that was used to help the Crusader states to be able to defend themselves, to hire men-at-arms, to also fund their activities. And so rather than pay this money, you could send someone on the crusade. So if you had you know, a son not doing very much, or maybe he was a kind of a troublemaker in the local area, or maybe you just want to get him out to see the world. Here's a great way to go about that. And certainly one way to kind of push possible rival off the table kind of thing. So there's lots of reasons why this could be happening at this point, at least in the native part of Wales, where this is much more of a difficult process. You've got a Norman uh, archbishop trying to convince a bunch of Welshmen that they want to join up with Henry II, who is not, while well, maybe their liege lord overall, isn't necessarily well loved at the time. From the Welsh perspective, of course, Baldwin is well known, I guess I should say from Henry's perspective, as being somewhat of a great orator. So his ability to preach to the people and convince them would have been an asset to have. But also, he was a Cistercian monk, which would, of course, lead him to links to the monks that are in Britain at the time, specifically the ones that will come into, well, at this stage, we're already there, at uh, Strata, Florida, and how that was influencing the argument. Because, of course, Cistercians were very much advocates of the Crusades and very much a part of this discussion and were built around the tour promoting the Second Crusade. So... Because they were well established, it made it easier for Baldwin to go into those areas with support and not be looked at necessarily as a Norman or an Englishman, but rather being one of them and one of the order that they follow. So it was a little easier to go into to, you know, the Welsh cathedrals and preach to them, you know, go into their masses and talk to them one on one instead of being seen as a tool of Canterbury and someone who's trying to push his way of thinking onto them. So that definitely has a big part of why he was successful. On top of all of that, Baldwin actually had been on crusade in the past, so that link and his ability to show that he'd already done it gave him yet another kind of chip in his arsenal that allowed him to kind of be able to call upon as being a link to why he's calling other people to the same thing and certainly his zeal as a monk was very evident at least for Gerald he definitely talked about it so another driving force for why Baldwin may have been in Wales at the time was in part because of a letter that was written to him from Peter Peter of Blois who had written to Baldwin in part because of a news that they had received of a disastrous defeat of Christian forces at the Battle of Hatton. Uh, this had happened in 1187, so one year before the mission. And of course, if you need to restock your forces, maybe you have to go to a different area. You have to go to a different location than your normal ones to try and get new blood into the mission. And we don't know this for a fact, but one has to wonder if the effects of these crusades and people coming home from them, much like any war, would start to have an effect on the excitement and desire 
by other young men to go serve in them. But as successful as Baldwin may have been, as convincing as he may have been, as able as maybe Gerald was as a preacher in the Welsh tongue, and there's debates to be made on that, the legitimate reality is that even if 3,000 men had taken upon the cross at the arrival of Baldwin, by the time he left, there certainly was nowhere near that number that actually went on crusade. And there were some areas that were quite hostile to the idea, in fact, suggesting that they would not have one of them join that crusade. So it's a hard measure to make, but certainly it does make you wonder whether the impacts of, you know, your local region, uh, the idea of traveling such a far distance, and then combine that with the fact that you have, you know, only a spiritual reward at the end of it and you may die I think that inducement is one of the things that may have made it so much more difficult to get people to sign on and by now in this era where it's the third crusade you know enough people have been through this and enough people have told other people about this that it may have been quite daunting to get more volunteers at this stage Another side problem here, which isn't really brought up, but is certainly something that we can see, is financing a crusade trip wasn't cheap, wasn't free, and that also might inhibit the ability, especially in Wales, where there isn't, uh, particularly in the native lands, currency that's native to Wales. Currency at this stage is probably being imported from other lands rather than being natively minted, and this doesn't change for most of independence. And so there isn't a great financial amount, and Wales typically in this era is fairly poor. And so the difficulties of convincing the nobility to leave their homes to sacrifice you know, their treasure to try and carry out something for spiritual reasons must have also have been difficult and must have been another hindrance to them. So overall, the idea of Welsh Crusaders, while there may have been more than what we know, we do know there were some. We know they had some semblance of responsibility and a desire to carry the cross. They definitely paid for it in some respects through tithes and offerings, but we don't really think there was large portions of men pretty much through the 11th and 12th, 13th centuries who joined this movement en masse or became greatly involved. And it would suggest that likely there was a much narrower scope to the crusading movement in Wales. It exists, but because it never becomes massive you don't really have loads and loads of people you can back up and say yeah definitely there was a lot of them that came um, and that's part of the problem because you can't really measure the size of these armies there's no real early evidence of this participation and thus you don't really have a good understanding of who's there combined with that the fact that a lot of these armies that are being developed are being developed by Norman uh, kings and Norman crusader knights. So they would mix in whatever Welsh people they picked up. They may be just being called Norman. They may be just being called English. They may not be recognized as being Welsh. And that's always an issue. It's always an extra problem here. So we don't really know typically what the numbers are. We just have kind of an, an understanding that there are some that certainly there must have been more than just a few because if we get the instance of the prince, Morgan, for example, he didn't go alone. He obviously must have went with a troop of some sort. The 44 who drowned may have been including, you know, outside of that 44, there may have been many others who went. And we know from Baldwin's campaign that there were attempts to try and draw him up more volunteers it's just a reality that they didn't get loads and because they didn't get loads there's a suspicion that there's various reasons for that we've discussed a few of them here and certainly there's much more detail and way more things that we could talk about with this but from the standpoint of this podcast we have to look at the facts that these these examples tell us that 
the Welsh Crusaders just aren't significant enough amounts to show up in the historical record in numbers. They're not significant numbers enough to, that we can point to them and say, yes, they achieved this, they fought in this battle, they did this thing. We just don't have any idea beyond a nebulous one that there was definitely something going on. And outside of Baldwin's campaign, we don't have a much larger campaign to point to. But we do know it happened. We do know it's significant. I think it's a good story to talk about because uh, this effort to get crusading knights out of Wales shows, or at least troops, that there was an attempt to motivate the Welsh to participate. There were Welsh people that did participate. There were definitely soldiers that were sent to the Holy Land from Wales, but under probably likely under Norman command and probably lost in that grouping. And so we may never really know what those numbers were in any great detail. But nonetheless, I think it's an interesting point in history. I think it's it's significant to talk about because, like I said, while it doesn't feature strongly in the records that we have, it you know, it's it's a massive thing that's going on on an international scale that obviously would affect Wales just as it affected every other European nation that believed in Christianity at this point in time. And the demands of the Pope and the needs of the East had pulled many people from their homes into an attempt to try and take on this massive achievement. Um, again, not judging it based on what it accomplished or what it was doing, but simply on the basis of an actual motivation that drove a number of people to do something based on a faith and f more or less faith alone initially as the driving force. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much for uh, taking time to listen to this podcast. I just want to thank you. I really want to thank my patrons. Um, we've been picking up a few in the last little bit and I want to thank you so much. Um, for those of you that are paying over the $5 amount, um, you will be getting notification on your extra things coming out. Uh, one of the things that I do want to do for the well, for our patrons, our supporters, uh, is to offer them uh, a family history uh, talk, in part because I've done my own family history research. There are some things I've learned about and some, some tactics to use which might be of use to you, uh, and certainly would love to share others if they have experiences that they they would like to talk about that will be coming up on the uh, patreon probably next month and uh for sure please check out some of our other things that we do at distractionsmedia.com thank you all for listening thank you for being tolerant of my pronunciations and uh we'll see you all next time and uh, thanks a lot take care bye this has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. I'm Daniel Norcross. And I'm Rory Dollard. And between us, we are England Cricket on 99.94. We'll be every week looking at the ups, the downs, the runners, the riders, the news and the views on all things English cricket. And believe you me, there are plenty of ups and downs. Join us, England Cricket, on 99.94.